Hello fellow mages, welcome to this like very unplanned vlog. So it is February 29th, um, it is a leap year, it is the bisext, and normally, I, I say normally, like it's not every four years, um, normally my tradition for this channel is that I like to take this day off work and just use it for reading, so the whole day I do nothing but sit and read and just see like how much I can read in a day. It's a whole extra day for reading, I get one extra day every four years and I use it on books, and that is the plan. Except, um, slight, last minute, change of plan, um, it is no longer what we're doing. I had been intending to use all of today to start reading um, Jay Kristoff's Empire of the Damned, which is the sequel to Empire of the Vampire. Look, <laughs> if you've been on my channel, you know the first book was like my most hype book ever. It's like grimdarky, high fantasy, medieval -y vampires. It's so me. Um, and unfortunately, I thought it was kind of painfully mid. Um, I still have not made <laughs> my like, I don't know, I, I wanted to do like a really in-depth review video um, probably like before the second book came out, but I've been too lazy to do that. But the point is, um, Jay Kristoff is doing a UK tour and I was not going to go on it because it comes nowhere near me. Um, until it was kind of mentioned that there are like unique like tour dust jackets that you can get only on this tour and I was like, I kind of want one of those. And I already had Thursday and Friday booked off of work for the Bisext. And I was like, look, do you know how hard is it to just get on a bus and go to London on my own to go to a book signing and then come back the same day? So that's what we're doing. So the plan now is I'm going to get like a five plus hour coach to London and then trek across London to go to the London like kickoff UK tour, um, author talk and signing. And then I'm immediately going to come back, trek across London, get on the coach back at midnight and get back to Leeds at like five in the morning. So this video is release day author talk and signing London road trip vlog and then a reading vlog and possibly like review I'm, I'm assuming there's maybe going to be spoilers but like the vlog section will not have any spoilers um and I'll, I'll like shout out when i actually get to the review section you'll know when it is because look i'll have the book i will not get to read it until like the bus ride home and even then i think i'll be dead so i anticipate the vlog will start tomorrow evening so if you feel like joining me for like this could be chaotic i have no idea how this is going to go um, I'm feeling cute though, so um, I'm in a good mood and when I say like I planned this, um, I bought the, it's Thursday now and I bought these tickets just before midnight on <laughs> Tuesday, so I've, I've had just over 24 hours to prepare myself for a, it's like a 20 hour round trip or something stupid, anyway. I can't promise the quality of the vlog footage because like I don't know what state I'm going to be in by the end of this, but it's an adventure. So I actually have to go catch my first bus to connect to my coach so i'm gonna go hopefully you guys stick around and hopefully i don't die <laughs> Switch back and forth when you didn't feel like really too much to you, the reader. 
Um, but also it was, it was just a fun way to kind of tell the story. Um, I wanted to feel, I wanted the book to read like a conversation that you're know, maybe sitting at a bar and listening to two people talking in the background. I wanted to kind of have an organic flow to it, a conversational tone. At the end of the audiobook for Dan, there there was a big battle sequence that I wrote, um, and it originally sat at the end of book two, so the part two, so kind of about the one third of the way into the book one. Um, and it was a really cool battle scene, I really enjoyed it. I just had to cut it because there wasn't there wasn't really a need for a yet another battle scene. There's enough in there already, so I kind of ended up compressing a lot of what happened in that original one into a later one and streamlined the book. But I I really liked the ebb and flow of that battle, so I think that the guys who did the audio books recorded that as a bonus chapter, and that's at the end of the audio book. Sometimes when you cut things out, I mean hopefully all the time. to write for me, it's usually action. Uh, my wife also reads all my books. I'm uh, being critiqued on your sex scenes. <laughs> it's an interesting experience. So, yeah, but I also, I also feel kind of self-conscious when I'm writing writing those, so they can be quite tricky. So it is now Friday evening. Um, I think I, I haven't edited anything yet, but like I haven't done anything yet since yesterday. Um, but yeah, I, I survived my how many hours <laughs> round trip to London? Like 18 or something? I, I can't count. 20? 20 or 21? I left the house at 10 a.m. I got back into the house sometime before 7 a.m. So like I was out a long time. <laughs> Did not go very smoothly either. Um, the mega bus. The bus was gonna be so late setting off. Like I sat down at the stand, checked it on the tracker, and it was like an hour. It set off from its original death. Like it's its point of origin. It set off over an hour late, and I was like, mm, that's gonna get me into London at like 6 p.m. And the event starts at 7, and the bus is at least 30 minutes. And I don't know where I'm going. And I would maybe like to also like have like a brief rest maybe some refreshments uh, i had to panic buy a national express bus ticket within like i had to like buy a new ticket and go and find that bus and get on it within like 10 minutes so that i could get to london in time and then the mega bus coming back was also somehow even though it sets off from london it was like oh yeah the driver hasn't turned up and we also don't have a bus so it's just inexplicably late and none of your reservations count anymore okay great love that <laughs> love that for me so it was <laughs> Travel was stressful, um, but it's fine. I'm fine. I survived. Really enjoyed the talk. I never really know what to say because, like, I feel like my experience with Jay Kristoff's writing has been like so 50/50. The Nevernight series was like one of my favorites. I think the year that I read it, Nevernight was my favorite book. I gave Nevernight a five stars. God's Grave like a 4.5. Dark Dawn was like a four. So it was really disappointing in, in that the series just like went downhill for me. But the thing is, like, a four stars isn't bad. I just feel like. The way Jay Kristoff says that he writes is that, and I might have some clips of this, he basically says that like he, when he was writing Nevernight, he had no idea what was going to happen. He was just like writing it with some ideas in mind of like where it was going, but he was just making it up as he went. And when we got to Dark Dawn, I was like, I, I can tell. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I can tell. Um, I think when I first read Empire of the Vampire, I was like, it's maybe like a four point something or just like a four. And then other days I'm like, it's a 3.5. So like, Mm, it's so it's so hard for me to know where I stand in my head I really want to like it here's the thing like it's like I want to like it this is the second signing I've been to never comes to Leeds I, I always have to do like a 12 plus hour round trip on a mega bus <laughs> to get anything signed but um, I was so smart I was like if I have to be on the mega bus I took an empty Evernight box with me to put it in 
and some bubble wrap oh my god and like it is it is gorgeous to be fair um this is i, I had to have this special edition i i know that i already have i'm gonna look so dumb at my next like book haul book unboxing i know i have five or six or maybe seven copies of this book now just, just don't say anything about it just don't say anything about it but i had to have this edition specifically um this one i'm definitely never getting rid of because it's the fact that it's like a fucking tour t-shirt on the back like with the dates and locations and i can't tell you how much i love that idea and how cool that is um this is my favorite cover variant i think like it's it's just matte blacks so, like it doesn't have like the the foil it's, well, it's kind of got some shine but it doesn't have like the colored foil of like some of the other editions it is also signed with like silver pen on the inside it's it's very cool and foil i haven't even seen the foil yet this is my first time seeing the foil of this book i do have it signed and i'm gonna hold this as still as possible so that i can blur out my name so this book is actually double signed um and triple signed if we count the dust jacket which i think is awesome um, i'm not gonna keep that extra additional dust jacket i'm just gonna keep this one and i might spray paint the pages black if i'm totally honest because an all black book sounds good to me like i know it already has like this is the waterstones special edition with the red sprayed edges um but I might just customise it more because it's mine and I might do that. So um, this is not going to be my reading copy though. This is like, of all the copies I have, this one's signed and dedicated to me. So like, this is going on my forever shelf. So I'm going to put that over there. So yeah, I very much did have to, like, I, I know it's meant to be like, a, or if you actually went to the event. But when there isn't one in your city or anywhere fucking near you, it's so hard. <laughs> Did my, like, collectory magpie brain get the better of me when it comes to, like, book special editions? Especially because it's, like, it's, like, musical, like, band, gig, tour themed, ah, um, maybe. And it's all black and, like, my little gothic magpie heart, ah. So please do not go into the comments and tell me how stupid I am for going all the way to London last minute. I don't even like to leave my house. Like, I don't like to go to the shops. I don't like to do anything. I don't like leaving the house. But, like, for a book, I'm like, I will go to one of my least favourite places on the planet. London is so fucking awful. I'm not even going to get into how much I hate London. Yeah, getting home at 7am. Um, we had a house viewing today. Like, somebody came to my house. And obviously I couldn't be asleep when that happened. And I've also been to see Dune today, because it released today, Dune Part 2. Which, and it's like a three hour movie. <laughs> yeah, you can tell, like, makeup kind of running down my face. Eyebrows left, clocked out for the day. So, like, it is very, it's very much just pyjamas and pillows and bed. Um, and book. So, I'm pretty much just going to spend the whole weekend reading this book. I do need to film my wrap up as well. But other than that, it's just going to be reading this book. Um, so that is pretty much what the rest of this vlog is gonna be. Oh my god, it's a standard edition, which, like, is like a shiny Pokemon on my freaking channel, because when do I ever have standard editions? It does still have the nice foil, though, which is, like, really nice for a standard edition book. And one thing I have to say is, like, the artwork, like, I love the maps. Yeah, pretty much the rest of this vlog is going to be me reading this book. Um, and it probably is going to contain, it's obviously going to contain spoilers for all of the first book. It's the sequel, so like, I don't know what to tell you. I feel like because this is the vlog, I'm probably just going to keep spoilers in. Like, I just want to talk about my feelings. If you saw how I did the last one, I imagine I'm going to do this the same way. Where I'm just going to like, if this is just going to be like, live reactions. Like, as I think of something to say, I'm probably just going to like, come on and say it. Um, up until the point where I finish the book and maybe have some thoughts on it. So this is just like a true reading vlog. Um, I do, you're not going to get like cute aesthetic footage of like my weekend because this is it. Like it's going to be me sat in bed <laughs> with like a little blanket on. I also have a killer headache as well which is not helping. The first book in the series was like my most hyped book ever and I just I know I got my hopes up too much and so I feel like my hopes are very tempered for this like I know what to expect and there's one specific thing. Should I just say it now? If we get another band of sassy talking misfits you know, have I, have I been a bit ridiculous with my plans? Um, yeah. And, like, here's the thing. Like, it's kind of awkward going to meet an author. And, like, the thing is, when I did meet him, like, I was very complimentary about, like, his work in general. And because the thing is, you know, I high fantasy vampire is a thing that I want so much more of, and people just don't do it. And, like, that's why this should be my favourite thing ever. The fact that it wasn't. <sighs> Disappointment. But, like, it's weird, because, like, I want to like this. I want to like this. And there's no re- like, there's no reason why it can't get better in book two. <laughs> Is it delusional? Very probably yes. But like, I, I've had books where some books just get better and, and some book series get worse and some peak in the middle. So like, it's, it's so hard to judge it off of a first book. I really, really liked the first half of the first book. It was the second half that fucking ruined it. But like, 
I am holding out hope for this series and I'm pretty sure it's just the trilogy so like unless this is just absolutely awful which I can't say it don't jinx it don't fucking jinx it I can't say it being that bad like I'm probably gonna end up reading like the whole series so yeah the rest of this is just gonna be me reading this book and um if you're not here for that I don't know what to tell you it's probably gonna be long it's probably gonna be very opinionated it's probably gonna be very ranty and rambly but like that's just who I am so <laughs> um I'm gonna just fluff this out of its jacket and yeah if you feel like joining me for like my live reactions live thoughts live spoilers oh I fucking knew that yeah, I'm so sorry, I'm getting distracted. The, uh, the quotation on the front, like the, the little prequely quotation dedication thing, um, is a quote from the architects, like the band, and I remember that last night, talking about music and music quotations, and it's funny because, like, so many of the songs and bands that he mentioned in relation to this book are songs that are on my Vampire Hunter OC's playlist from, like, 2012. 2013. I get. I guess maybe just a lot of songs are just Vampire Hunter coded, I suppose. Maybe we are just built the same, for better or worse. Well, like, maybe we are just like same bitch, different shape. So <laughs> I need to start reading this. Like, I want to start reading this. Um, I'm, I'm a day late. It's the 1st of March. I was gonna start this on the 29th, but like, wish me luck. Prayer circles, summoning circles, please. Um, and yeah, pray for the rest of this vlog, because like, I don't know what it's gonna be like, and it's probably gonna be hectic. So, good luck to you! <laughs> trying to watch it good luck to you hello okay time for an update i oh, yeah let's do that um ignore the fact that i am on my floor so my update i was actually thinking i was planning to update like whenever i got to I, this book is done in like parts so there's like part one part two part three whatever um and i thought i would maybe update whenever i got to the like whenever i'd finished the first part whenever that might be um but i don't know how many pages that is gonna end up being i have therefore taken the decision i'm like 100 pages in at the moment so i figure out i am at this point kind of gonna weigh in a little bit on how i'm feeling because like 100 pages in watch page 120 be like the end of the first part or whatever but like basically my initial thoughts while reading this um i think the easiest thing to say in summation is that it's not as good as the first part of book one but it is much better than like the second half of book one so i'm i'm kind of trying to be like like it's in the middle right so far it's in the middle it's not as good as the best parts of book one but it's nowhere near as bad as like the bad parts of book one like we're treading water we're doing fine i'm enjoying it enough at the moment it's like it's it's not quite hitting the highs that like the start of book one did i'm enjoying the reading so far i'm engaged with the story i'm remembering the characters like i'm, I'm enjoying the event so far so we're definitely no lower than a three stars. I don't know if we're as high as a four star yet. 100 pages in. For this book, that's early days. It could go either way. So I don't feel the need to put on fucking clown makeup and play like Boo Boo the Fool music just yet. Um, <laughs> there is hope that I will like this book um, because so far it's not bad. Um, there have been this, that there, there is so much sassy back and forth back chatting puns wit blah 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 but so far it's mostly only between um gabe and like this one i am i doing yeah i'm doing spoilers in this video aren't i so it's pretty much just between gabe and dior it's it's like i can almost see it coming together you know i, I can see it sort of coalescing and i'm like don't you fucking dare don't you fucking dare some of you have got to have a different personality so like i'll let you know how it goes um i did have a few thoughts while reading only three <laughs> apparently i only had three thoughts while reading but i i was kind of spitballing some of them when i vlogged reading the first one and pretty much all of my predictions came true so um i'm just gonna like do the same thing here and i'm gonna give you like my thoughts and feelings um oh no i had four thoughts i had four whole in thoughts reading this book great for me the first one page 10 there's a wolf called malice and then another wolf called valor and i'm like are we doing is that a john Gwynn reference because he his was malice valor and then ruin and wrath but the last two there are four wolves and i was thinking so i was like oh was it not a reference apparently i thought that was worth writing down though um the other one oh yeah so um gabe has been reunited with i'm, I'm sure he calls him lackey as a nickname i can't remember his actual name He's basically Gabe's uh, Irish coded protege, ex protege, and obviously he doesn't know what any of the events of book one basically. But he's run into Gabe, and like they're now traveling together with Dior. Um, and his he has like a catchphrase. I fucking see you, Jay Kristoff. I know what you're doing. Um, so when Gabe's basically like, "Oh, 
thanks for having my back in this fight or whatever, this guy says, your back, my blade. Like, you know, I will stand at your back. I, I will defend you. Like, we'll face back to back and I will defend you. That is, like, the implication. I can so see this man being driven to turn against Gabriel and stab him in the back, and he's gonna say, your back, my blade. Tell me that's not gonna happen. It's so... What he's saying is, I'm gonna stab you in the back, and I'm waiting for it to happen, and if he does that, like, that's that's the exact kind of wordplay that Jay Kristoff likes to do. Like, he, he said it twice now. He said it on page 68, and at some point, he said it since then. I'm calling it now. Oh, one thing I did like was um, the Divok in this. So they're the vampires that have insane levels of strength. Their symbol is, like, the bear. They're extremely strong, um, and you meet, like, some of the enemies they've fought quite early on in this book um, have, like, like, imagine, like, a massive warhammer or like a mall or something like that and it's it would obviously weigh like imagine a person lifting like a warhammer but there's just like an entire car on the end of it like that much weight in metal uh, and obviously that weighs more than the person holding it like yes they have superhuman strength and can lift that amount they don't weigh more than the thing that they're lifting and physics is still a thing and i'm like i think this is like the first book i've ever seen superhuman strength physics actually account for like the weight and like force momentum distribution of like the person wielding the weapon so like when they if they swing the weapon obviously that momentum is going to pull them off their feet and just send them flying and it does like that is a thing but they use it to their advantage in their fighting style and i can't tell you like how glad i am to actually because i so often think about that in books in movies in all sorts of fantasy media where a character is super strong but there's no consistency in what can like lift that character off the ground. So I'm, I'm just, I'm actually quite glad that J. Christoph has thought of this, realised this, like I guess we share a brain cell sometimes. He's like, yeah, I'm not gonna just ignore the fact that in this world where everything else in physics works the same, um, he's like, yeah, they would actually be affected by like this, this, like, like the resulting momentum of them swinging a giant weapon that weighs several tons. Like, yeah, they would be pulled off their feet, but that's part of their fighting style and they use that to like catapult themselves like around the battlefield in like this very hectic, destructive kind of way. And I'm like, I actually really, really like that. And I'm here to give praise where I see it. As dumb as some things might be in this book, um, I, I like that there are like clever moments like that where it's like this really obvious thing that so many other franchises just overlook. Jay Kristoff has been like, yeah, I'm gonna address it and work it into the story so it's not ridiculous. It is, but in a way that is cool and makes sense for like this world and these characters. So I liked that. Oh, and the other thing, I, I've said this so many times in the, <laughs> with the first book, this series, the first book especially, is the exact plot of the movie Pitch Black. You know with Vin Diesel? Because it's literally like the plot of, I'm, I'm gonna spoil Pit, I'm so sorry um, to spoil the movie Pitch Black for you. Um, but it's basically, that's a, it's a sci-fi, but it's like, it's a planet where there's like a solar eclipse and it's like a lasting darkness that's gonna last a long, long, long time. So there's no sunlight anymore, it's always nighttime. Like these nocturnal monsters come out of like the, the deep cave system of the planet and they're picking people off. And the main character is this guy who's like a, he's not entirely human and he has like different powers and different eyesight and like super strength and he can like see in the dark and like basically a lot of the powers that Gabriel has, he's not being excommunicated but he is like a convict. And there's a girl pretending to be a boy. And then finally on page 103, a scene right out of pitch black is that um, because Dior is a girl she's disguised as a boy but like she's on her period she's bleeding and because Gabe is a vampire like he, he can sense this because he can literally smell blood um, and so can like other characters and it's kind of like they now know that she's a girl and I'm like the exact same scene happens in pitch black where Riddick's like yeah she's bleeding I know she's a girl, and I'm like, do you know what? It's every single time, like, at this, it's not a reference, it's not a reference. At this point, it's literally the exact plot of Pitch Black. Even the characters that survive in the first book of this series are parallels of the same characters <laughs> that survive in Pitch Black. So, yeah, so far, 100 pages in, it's okay, it's fine, I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm not feeling fatigued, I'm enjoying reading it, I'm interested in where the plot is going. There's kind of like two options before the characters at the moment, they're like, oh we could go up to the Highlands or we could go see this, like, Vampire Jedi Master, I don't know what, <laughs> like, that's the vibe I get. We can go see them and learn about like all the vampire powers and stuff, and I'm like, okay, 
of the options afforded to me, I would really like to go and see what's going on with, like, these vampire powers, and I would really like to, like, learn what's happening with, like, the cult and, like, the Asani and all that. Um, I really do not care to go to the Highlands. I'm sure it's interesting, but, like, I don't want this detour that takes me away from the fact that I want to know what's going on with, like, the vampires and the Sanguimancy and, like, the Holy Grail. Like, that's, that's the interesting plot point for me. I don't need to see more characters talking in... I don't want to see Jay Kristoff writing in any more Scottish accents than I have to. I'm, I'm really hoping, I'm really hoping at this point that we're going to lean towards, yeah, let's go investigate the vampire stuff, and not, like, if they say, yeah, let's go to the Highlands first, I'm going to be like, fucking bitch, <laughs> just <laughs> take me to the vampires! So far in the middle ground of where book one was. I don't think I'm going to get, I don't know, maybe? I don't necessarily think I'm going to get to the same level of enjoyment, like those same highs as the start of book one, because I am such a sucker for, like, stuff like the Grey Wardens, you know, like in Dragon Age, where it's like, um, any sort of very, like, stoic society or organisation of, like, like protecting the people, like in, in Grey Wardens it's fighting the Darkspawn, in this it's fighting the vampires. It was like the, the, the school, like the fortress at, was it San Michon? I think it is. It, it, it was kind of like, you know, that was like your, that was this world's, like, uh, magical school, magical training academy type thing, you know, but it was for vampire hunters, and it was like big and gothic, but also like medieval feeling, and it's training vampire hunters, and I was like, that, I enjoyed that so much, I love that setting so much, I really liked the whole, uh, like, mentor, mentee, like, the, the tears between, like, Gabe, Aaron, and Greyhand, I was like, I, I liked that so much, Greyhand was like, maybe like, one of my favourite characters, I think possibly my favourite character of the first book, but before the book sort of like, shat the bed in the second half, but in the first half of the book he was like my favourite character. My favourite type of character at least. And like I, re I I just don't think we're gonna get back to that setting because like we've been past that, like we've had that bit, and I'm like I know there is more of Gabe's past to be explored, so maybe we'll get more flashbacks and like maybe that will bring it up a bit for me, but I guess like the vibes in the setting I really 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 enjoyed. Those sort of like beginning sections of book one it's, it's not that I don't like Dior or anything, like, she, I, I feel neither here nor there about stuff like Dior, I'm like, she's fine, I'm never a big fan of, like, children as characters, that's just, like, a me thing, and, like, I don't dislike Dior, but I'm also not crazy about her either, and I, I feel like she's kind of like the, she's like the white-haired, literally the white-haired, magical, super-powered anime protagonist of this series, and I'm just not really into that. <laughs> I, I know she's meant to be, like, the fan favourite, and, like, she's just not my particular favourite style of character, so, like, I, I don't mind her. For me, the whole book can't be carried by her. It, she's just... I'm like, eh, it's, yeah. Bleh. Yeah, that's kind of how I'm at at the moment. I think there's potential. I'm trying to find it. I'm like that meme, I'm like that TikTok meme where it's like, I'm finding it. <laughs> Give me a minute. But yeah, nothing that I'm disliking so far. I'm liking it all so far. I know it's early days. Um, I'm not feeling too trepidatious going forward. I'm not feeling too... I'm not feeling negative in any way. So that's, that's my update for the time being, um, and I guess I will update more either when I've, like, I need to have something substantial to say, like, either in terms of, like, feedback or plot or events or something. So at the moment we're just kind of following the aftermath of book one and following Gabe and Dior, and I'm like, just, I, I, I need the plot to start moving, like, moving forward, um, before I can really start making judgments at this point in time. Um, and like, to say I'm 100 pages in, I don't feel like I've read a lot. I don't feel like much has happened, but I guess I'm 100 pages in. I guess I'll check in when I'm maybe like another 100 pages in. <laughs> okay. Okay, slight interruption, but I almost forgot to mention that um, while I was at the signing, they had like a little merch table, and it was pretty like picked clean by the time I got there. Um, the only things left when I went were like some brooches of like Mia's Gravebone dagger, um, and these, and these are Empire of the Vampire like tarot cards? And I can't think of any other time I'm ever going to unbox these, so I actually, I really like the box they come in. Um, it's so cute. And these are the cards. I really like the design. So this is the style that the cards are drawn in. I really like it. It, it matches the book. It's really, it's really distinctive for a tarot card style, but I thought they were just Empire of the Vampire, but they're not, because this one is Mia from Nevernight, which I like because, honestly, I do like Nevernight more than Empire of the Vampire, so. <laughs> and apparently this is Gabe in his tricorn hat with his tiny snatched waist. Sir, what do you need a slightly little waist like that for? <laughs> I'm putting these away now. <laughs> okay, so this is only going to be a quick update because my camera has died and like we can tell I'm still looking pretty rough. I'm very exhausted. So like my ability to like think and like form sentences 
maybe not the best right now. This isn't really like a specific point about anything, it's just so far my kind of takeaway from this is just that a lot of me just kind of wants Jay Kristoff to like get on with it. Like I, I know these are like chonky as hell books um, and I do like a big chonky fantasy but when I'm reading a book that's, that's this thick, that's this long, usually it has a reason and I, I just feel like there's so much that could just be like cut out or streamlined or it, it's the, the vibe I get is like we're trying to get from point A to point B and usually all like the little stops in between that sort of waylay like the inevitable denouement of the book or whatever. I'm not I don't know who I think I am sitting in a Game of Thrones blanket throwing out English essay ass words right like that's that's not it I need to turn it down I don't know who I think I am my point is all these little like bits in between that kind of form the bulk of your story that like you know it's it's the stuff that happens between like your start point and your end point and I, I feel like usually they have so many moments of like character growth or like it, it seems and like that they're kind of they are there in this book but so much of me just thinks that like so much of this is it feels more like padding than anything else there's there are a lot of like fight scenes and fight sequences so far and I remember at the talk Jay Kristoff was saying things like oh there was initially I think he said at the end of this book there was like a, a big battle sequence that or it might have been at the end of Empire of the Vampire at the end of one of the books there was like a big battle sequence that got cut out or like shaved right down I think he said it was just because he thought it didn't really serve any purpose um like the even though it was really really cool and he really liked that battle scene and sequence and like the fight choreography um he said something like it just it the book didn't need another like big battle scene or fight scene but i have to ask i'm like i i totally agree but also because <laughs> I don't think any of like what I'm reading so far, the, at any time there's a fight and there's like a lot of fight choreography, sometimes I'm like, mm, just get on with it. <laughs> I feel like the fights in this are just padding for time or like word count or it's because it's like, right, we've had a lot of conversation so now we need like a big action scene so that when we have more conversation later it doesn't feel like there's only talking and like I, I get that but I, I feel like those scenes have to be doing something else. It can't just be a fight because otherwise it would be kind of boring. Some of them are kind of fine where it's like, I'm, I'm trying to think of like specific exa examples, but like they're all bleeding together in my head. I don't know. I, I feel like if they don't have a secondary purpose, my eyes start to glaze over and I'm like, I'm tired of being like, who's, you know, firing off a, a silver shot wheelock pistol or whatever. Or like, ah, oh, cutting things up with Ash Drinker. I'm like, okay, I get it. I get it. Make it do something else. I, I just, I don't, at this point, I don't want to read about my phone just decided to cut me off, so like, I'm assuming I need to stop talking. Um, the other thing is as well, as I'm reading this, again, there's kind of like this A to B plot. Oh, and the thing with Celine as well, like, here's the, here's the thing, like, and I'm... In the first book, I think the big reveal was like the Holy Grail thing, and it's like, oh dear, is the Holy Grail. Reading the first book, I'm sure back in that vlog was me being like, we all know that it's it's got to be Dior, the white-haired anime protagonist that everyone is protecting. So, like, with this one, I, I feel like the big... There's got to be two types of reveal. It's either got to be... Because they're, they're trying to get to this... Um, Celine, the Sangromancer, Gabe's sister, is, like, leading them. You know, she's taking them for answers or whatever about, like, the Asa Asani, Asana, which should help Dior get answers as, like, how to end day's death or whatever either there's going to be some sort of like late book reveal where either that's because it can't end in this book it has to end in the next book so there's got to be a whole 700 pages worth of delay so either this is all just like a a wild goose chase red herring sort of situation where it's like it's not what you thought or this or that or the other or maybe Dior really does have to die and that's like the twist at the end of the book I don't know but the thing that I'm honing in on is the fact that Selena said like there are these four the vampires that have the sanguimancy and I'm sure there's two women and two men um, and she's not one of them that these are like the, the masters or whatever and we know that Gabe is of this bloodline like, that's his whole thing, is that that's why he can do the, like, in the first book, like, that's that's his special power, right? I don't understand why, <laughs> like, he knows, she's literally just said, Gabe, there's four of them, I'm sure there's two women and two men, and he knows that his dad is a vampire with these powers, and I'm like, Gabriel, has she just fucking name-dropped your father? Which one of these two guys is it? They just glazed over it, and I don't know whether I'm, like, am I being stupid? It's not one of these two guys, it's just some other vampire that isn't one of these Sanguimancy, Esana, Masters, whatever. She just name-dropped them. And I'm just like, 
we never got a reveal for who Gabriel's father was, and so at this point I'm like, it has to be one of these guys. But nobody's commented on it. Not even Gabriel, who has been told to his face, hey, of this bloodline that you know you're from, I'm just gonna tell you <laughs> the name of two men, the two men that exist in this bloodline, you are from, and not a single person says anything about it. And it's like, is, am I reading too much into it? Or is Gabriel just real stupid? Do you, like, I know that this isn't like the big question, I know they have bigger things to worry about, but you think he'd be like, hey, you're talking about the bloodline that I'm from, the bloodline where I don't know my own father. You've just name dropped two men that are off that bloodline that's like super rare and that nobody knows about and you only, there's two guys, <laughs> there's 50-50, it's like, who is the father? Is this going anywhere? <laughs> anyway, I don't really know what else to say about this so far other than it's not bad, but it's not hitting much more than just mediocre at this point, which I feel like is foreshadowing me having to wear some sort of clown face paint by the end of this video. Like, I'm starting to have packages arrive as well, and it's to the point where it's like, I know that so many of these packages contain special editions of this book, and I'm like, it needs to get good, it needs to get good, otherwise I really am Boo Boo the Fool. My plan is just to keep reading and hope that it gets better, and hope that maybe it hits the highs of like book one, because again, if we get onto like actual like more like vampire stuff and silver saint stuff and prophecy stuff and like things actually happening and not just stuff that feels like middle padding then i feel like i could really enjoy it like this oh how am i damning myself more if i just keep saying the words but it has so much potential it's like yeah but <laughs> we'll see okay i'm holding out hope so this is going to be really janky to edit now because of this stupid footage so like i'm just gonna go <laughs> i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go Oh, pray for me. Pray that I like it. <laughs> Hello, okay, so, um, firstly the reason I don't like complete trash in this update is because I just got done filming another video. Um, and I kind of thought it was about time to update because I'm now like 400 pages, or like, from 400 and something pages, um, into the book now, and I realise I've only updated once so far. But kind of weirdly, I feel like that first update is just sufficient. I, I don't know what else to say, I feel like I had so much to say with the first book, but I just, I just don't feel like I have a lot to comment on, like, um, it's kind of funny to think because I've, in addition to this copy, I've, I've just done a book haul and I've just hauled, like, spoilers, like, six other copies of this book. I don't know, things are happening, the story's progressing, like, okay, here's the, here is a thing that I can say, is that, um, a big chunk of this in, like, the second part of the book, whereas before we had Gabe's past and then there's three timelines there's there's him telling the story in the room which i suppose is the present um but then there's like the main chunk of the story which is the stuff that he's doing with dior that's like the main story and the main plot and then there's like the even more past from that which was like gabriel joining the order and whatnot and that was the bit i found interesting and the stuff with dior i was like i get it it's fine um and honestly part of i always have said that it reminds me of exactly the plot of pitch black and i've said that already in this vlog and i said it in the last one but it is! It's the plot of Pitch Black! Okay, now, I have never played, and apparently this is like, I don't know if this is spoilers or not, because I've not played it and I've not seen it. Um, I've never played The Last of Us, and I haven't watched the TV series because I haven't played the game. And I, I, I honestly just don't care. <laughs> I don't care about spoilers though, so like, I, I know the story of The Last of Us and like, what it's about. And I did see a video from another creator which like, basically said that the first book is almost like, beat for beat, exactly the same as the plot of the video game The Last of Us. So like the relationship between Gabe and Dior is the same as like, I think they're called Joel and Ellie? And like something about her like with her special blood and like the the way that events play out is almost, it feels like you've just reskinned them. Um, and there have been other times in this when I've been reading this when certain things in this seem like, like how their tattoos are basically because they glow when things get near and it's like, oh, that's, that's kind of derivative of um, Sting from like The Lord of the Rings. Not just like Sting the Musician, specifically the sword. And it's like, I understand that in fantasy a lot of things are going to, like, you're going to get things retold or rehashed a lot and like, you know, things can be based on other things and inspired by other things. Like, how many fantasies do we get where it's like, oh, it's basically this story but like from this whole new different perspective and how many retellings and things do we get? And that's fine. I just feel like if, I, I wonder if the reason that I really am not that into all the stuff with Dior specifically is because I wonder if it is so highly derivative. It's, it's so much so that I do not think it can be accidental. I think Jay Kristoff is either watched that series or like, play I th he must have played the games because I think the series came out after. But like, he must have like played the games or like read about them or heard about them from somewhere because I think, 
I'll link the other creator's video in the description, but like, and I'm, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong to be inspired by something or like, because it's, it's not, obviously like the whole world in this is like very different, like it's different enough that like none of this would ever stand up in court, like it's not that kind of a thing, but I just wonder if, because it feels so derivative and just like it's a hash out and like a reskin of something that you've you've seen before that it's kind of like and even for me having not seen it i just wonder if it's it just didn't feel great like i wonder if that's why i don't like those sections as much whereas the parts that feel more like more care was put into them almost and more thought was put into them is the stuff to do with like i, I liked the stuff to do with the order and the silver saints and like i liked more about gabe's past and i don't know if it's just because i gravitate towards those sort of stories and again it's my the i think a lot of it was like they deal was always with like the sassy talking misfits and like i fucking hate them and <laughs> your bard who was one day away from retirement the point i'm trying to get to is that i my least favorite part is the stuff with Dior, and I know that's the main story, I just don't think they're as well done as like the rest of the story. A massive part of this middle bit is Gabe and Dior being separated, and so for a whole, like, like I don't know, like a lot, like, between 15 and 100 pages, I can't recall exactly how much, it's all just Dior on her own, <laughs> and Gabe's not even in it, and at this point I'm like, I just don't really like Dior, I don't dislike her, I don't hate her, like, I don't want anything bad to happen to the character specifically out of, like, spite, like I, I do with some characters that I hate, I just don't care about Dior, it's just, it's so white-haired anime protagonist, and like, again, she feels a lot more like a caricature than, than an actual character to me, um, but I just think that's, that she's been made piecemeal from other parts of things and like other characters like being it's, it's the whole with the sassy talking and all this and then like the flip-flopping between like being such a oh she's like this orphan from the streets she's such a hard ass but also cannot leave one f like farmer or fisherman with like a gammy leg to just die has to risk the whole world on this one guy's leg <laughs> i wasn't a fan of like a massive middle section of this and it did drag i am back to reading about gabe now but like it, uh, one of the characters in this, Phoebe, and like, to be fair, a lot of the characters in this have just such annoying Scottish accents. Like, not that, I'm not even going to go with the Scottish accent as a thing, but Jay Kristoff writing the Scottish accent so that you know they're all Scottish. And it's weird because at the same time you've got people like Gabe and Dior talking in perfect English and then to remind you that they're all French, they just put in a oui or a mon ami <laughs> every now and again. And it's like, you can't just be speaking. You can't just be like, ah, oh, fuck my face, fuck you in the ass, mon chéri. Like, you can't just do that. You can't just do that. And then you just have some other character who has to have every word written in their accent like oh you dunna ken what you do in the and it's like shut the fuck up shut up Stop, just write the words just tell me they have an accent and write the words and maybe throw like one or two in there but like it's so over the top and i'm like you weren't doing this with the french accents it's so tiresome stop it again i don't like any of this as much as i liked the beginning of book one but i don't hate any of it as much as i hated the ending of book one I did not enjoy the parts with Dior, and she does continue to be an idiot. <laughs> Decisions were made, and all of them bad. I'm just like looking at my notes. Oh, I'll tell you what though, I'll tell you what though, I know what I did say. I told you about the guy, he's called Laklan, Laki. Um, his whole little catchphrase being, <laughs> my blade, your back. I was so right, I was so right, because like he starts saying that on page 68 and I was like, I'm fucking calling it. 300 pages later, page 376, he finally says, <laughs> your back, my blade, and stabs Gabe up through the back. And I'm like, do you know, just Jay Kristoff, can you please be less predictable? <laughs> See, the thing is, the very first time the character said it, I was like, I know exactly what this is building up to. I, I like, the minute he said that, anyone with half a brain is probably going to go, it's a weird catchphrase, my dude. You can see where that fits better. I feel like he's worked backwards. I feel like he's thought of something somebody would say when stabbing someone in the back. And then he's gone, how can I turn this into like a vaguely suggestive catchphrase that, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't clock onto right away. But the issue is you do clock onto it right away. And he says it several times. So like, if you didn't pick up on it the first time, you're basically stumbling over it the second time. Cause it's like, why is this his catchphrase? What a weird catchphrase. The fact that he even has one. <laughs> We're just giving Silver Saints catchphrases. <laughs> the the other thing, oh, I'm going to show you a picture of Lachlan in a minute. Um, <laughs> the thing I wanted to point out is, I, I like the artwork in this. Like, it's a, it's an interesting style. I like that it's, like, I like the vibe of the artwork. I think it fits with the book. Um, I did just want to show you this one artwork because I opened the page and I had to sit for like a good, like, 15 seconds because it's so boy band. It's so, the Silver Saints are in a boy band. <laughs> you cannot tell me these guys are not posing for an album cover there's no like real spoilers on it or anything. 
<laughs> like, what's with the stance? What's with like the little, he's just like, hey. <laughs> it's so, you know they've got a screamo band. Actually thinking of what's probably gonna happen to some of them, <laughs> they probably do have a screamo band. That's where I am at the moment. It's fine, like, it's fine. I do kind of feel a bit like I'm getting led on by the book sometimes because it keeps talking about like this legendary uh, prophecy, whatever it is, and like the sangromancy, and I'm like, do you know, these are the parts that I'm interested in. And I feel like it's because that sort of stuff featured so, like the scripture and like the, the histories and like all of that, like a lot of the vampire lore featured most heavily in the first half of the first book. And I feel like that's why I like it because like, I really like the world building stuff. Granted it is very simplistic, but like I enjoy that sort of thing in a fantasy. And I feel like the book keeps telling me, like, oh, we're gonna learn about, like, sanguimancy and all these powers and things. It's like, I know how they work. It's like, I, I know what Celine's deal is. I, I feel like, you know, it's like Gabe's of this bloodline. Is, is he gonna get any more powers? Are we actually gonna, like, learn more about it and see more about it? And I know it's dragging on because there's gonna be a third book, but part of me is just like, I... I need more. Like, I, I need, I need more stuff. <laughs> I feel like we keep being told about all these things that people are going to find out at some point and like, I know the characters can't learn everything, I know they keep, have to like, they have to keep building up to stuff, and I get it, but like, I as a reader need some catharsis that isn't just Dior getting saved for the 50,000th time and like, oh, Gabriel survived his wounds again, and like, now Phoebe's here, and I'm like, I'm just, I'm not a massive fan of Phoebe. Like, when I went to see the talk, Jay Kristoff said that I think his favourite character in this book is Phoebe, and I feel like it shows, I'm just like, I just personally don't really care. I know we were going to get, like, another witty, sarcastic kind of character, and even the characters that are supposedly, like, stoic and whatever are still, like, you know, every everyone's wisecracking, and they're, they're being all so waspy all the time, and I'm like, okay, I get it. Jay Kristoff knows how to write one kind of dialogue, and that's it, and, like, that's all we're going to get, but, like, I feel like when every Every single character is like that. It, it makes me like, like, Dior and Gabe do not stand out as like witty, smart ass, uh, smart talking, wise cracking characters because every single character is like that. Every single one. Every single one is doing puns and jokes and japes and I'm like, because you wouldn't think they were living in an apocalypse, would you? Also, I have a question. Can they, like, this is so, I live in the rhubarb triangle so this is like so niche, but like, I know all they eat is like potatoes, but I, can you, rhubarb grows, like, you when you force rhubarb, it's because you keep it in the dark. Like, could they not be growing mad rhubarb out here? <laughs> I would be making a fortune in this apocalypse selling a rhubarb. I'm assuming, I'm assuming they can. I think after this, I'm actually going to go and Google, like, the, <laughs> the growing techniques for rhubarb, because I'm pretty sure putting it in the dark makes it grow faster. So I feel like the next time I check in is probably either going to be at the end or at some point before the end, like before I read the finale. I am reading this so slowly as well. It turns out that I just cannot read on weekdays. Uh, that is usually true for me. I feel like I get n n like 95% of my reading gets done on a weekend, which is probably why I read so little. Like I get between like six and eight days a month to read basically when you look at it that way, which is not fun. But um, I will check in again. Like I'm not blown away by it. Like it's fine. I do not think this book is like, sometimes the second book in a series can be so much better than the first. I feel like this is just a continuation of some of the more mediocre points of the first book. Like it's nowhere near as bad as the, all like the worst bad parts, but it's nowhere near as good as the good parts. But to be fair, I have some book to go. So either the ending could get better or like the last book, it could get so much worse. Um, I'm hovering like, <laughs> still like around like a mid three stars I'm gonna go and and then at some point um, I'm gonna finish reading this book wish me luck <laughs> okay so excuse the hair I'm like halfway through dying it um I am right on like the last book like the last part I'm on page I think it's 559 because there's no page numbers and I'm pretty sure this is going to be like the last section so what I'm gonna do is kind of like what I did last time where I'm just gonna kind of, like, this is the big ending, right? This is the big finale, and um, I, I think there's, like, a lot of pictures in this bit. I can see, like, at least, like, two or three. So, yeah, this is it. I am excited to see how it ends. Like, one thing I can say for this book is it gets good 500 pages in. <laughs> 500 pages in is where I finally started to, like, actually um, enjoy reading this. Like, it's, I, I, I would say it's kind of like a, a three, three and a half star quality up until... <laughs> the 500 page mark when things finally start to happen we finally start to get a move on when it finally starts to like actually hold my attention the book I, as, as far as I can tell it really is going to end the same way as book one obviously book one ended with Gabe storming San Michon and like fighting the Silver Saints to get Dior back because they were holding her captive and potentially going to kill her so it's Gabe storming like the fortress of San Michon to save Dior and in this case Dior is in I can't remember oh it's some Ossian castle I can't remember what it's called and she's been held captive by the Divok who are possibly going to kill her again in relation to this prophecy 
So it's Gabe storming a big castle fortress to save Dior. And I'm like, this is how book one ended. Is this how every book's gonna end? I don't, I don't know what to expect. I mean, actually, you know what? I do know what to expect. <laughs> At this point, I, I don't remember what I have and haven't talked about. I, I almost feel like none of it really bears discussing. Like, uh, there are probably things that I could comment on and like, like plot or character or theories, but I'm like, at this point, <laughs> like, do I bother? I'm just so unenthused. I'm just so, like, I'm excited for the ending because like the last like 50-ish pages that I've read have been actually engaging and interesting and like things are happening and it's not, it's not just like plodding along <laughs> through like the previous like 500 pages. Oh my god. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read the finale. I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of, I don't know, people have got to die, there's probably going to be some sort of like devastating something. I'm not attached to anyone so like I'm not going to care who lives and who dies. Yeah with that said I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get on with it. I say I'll keep like checking back in, like what if I have no reaction and I just don't check in at all? It could happen. Um, okay I'm gonna, I'm just gonna blitz through this last section so <laughs> I'll see you in a minute I guess. So just before I like go too much further, I do just kind of want to say one thing about how dumb I think this idea is of storming the fortress with all like the slayers and dusk dancers as like they're like Gabe's army, right? They're like his 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 backup or whatever. Oh, it's so stupid <laughs> because the vampires, the divic that they're fighting, have discovered that if they drink dusk dancer blood, it's like it's like being on crack. <laughs> It's like it's like getting a it's like getting like the little star in Mario like it makes them super strong and super fast and the reaction's better and like like when Gabe drinks it he becomes like super Gabe right um, and that's what they have in like the little vials around their neck is this dust dancer blood and it's just kind of like a super like boost it's like a big power up right Gabe is going to fight the vampires and he's bringing an army of dusk dancers with him and I'm like Gabe those are walking snack packs. Those are power-ups. Like, it's so, like, what a risky move. Like, I I don't understand. <laughs> like, I'm um, full offense. If I was a vampire, because like, I, like, I know it's gonna be like, oh, there are some like big name characters that are gonna be fine or whatever. But like, if any one vampire gets their hands on any one Dusk Dancer and just like, takes a fucking sip, babes, you now are fighting super vampires. I would have left the Dusk Dancers at home. I know they're meant to be like padding out his forces. Generally when you fight an army, it's like it's like when you fight people that can raise the dead. It's like, oh, I bring 10,000 troops and you bring 10,000 troops. But if you kill a thousand of my troops, you gain them to your side because you can like resurrect them. It's kind of like along the same lines as that. It's it's just it's just so it's so weird. If if any of the vampires drink any of the blood of the people they're fighting, which is highly likely, because they do that. Did anyone think of this? Did no? Did anyone consider this? I mean, I'm thinking did Gabriel consider this, but did did Jay Kristoff consider this? Like nobody's done it yet. <laughs> but I'm like, I just I just think that if I knew that consuming a certain thing gave me basically like additional superpowers on top of the powers I already had and somebody was like hey there's an army of that thing that makes us super strong marching on our doorstep I'd be like okay <laughs> it hasn't come back to bite him in the ass and I'm like why not maybe I'm just thinking that like Lilith the one who is giving them all like the dust dancer blood maybe she just didn't tell them where she's getting it from maybe they just know if I drink this vial of blood it's special blood and it makes me super strong but you would think with an army on their doorstep they might go oh actually if you drink one of these guys you will also get super strong so when you fight the first one maybe just like let her sip <laughs> take a sip babes it's, it's, it's a weird thing to just have out there as a possibility and like no one no one is taking advantage of it Anyway, I will keep reading. Should I be placing bets on who dies? 
I don't know, I don't feel like anyone is more doomed by the narrative than anyone else. <laughs> They're all just kind of hanging out. Anyway, um, interruptions aside, let me continue. Okay, so, um, I finished the book. What do I even say? <laughs> I, first of all, I would like to say R.I.P. to the Dust Dancer formerly known as Prince. Um, we barely fucking knew you. It was an interesting ending. I suppose I mean that sincerely, in the way that, like, the last, like, 100 pages of this book was the interesting part of this book. Like, if I were to reread this book, I probably would not but I might reread the last like 100 pages. It's all a satisfying mix of a lot of action and a lot of revelation and maybe some character growth, but I don't, I don't know, have the characters really grown that much? Mm. I mean, they're there. Um, and actually, they're all still here. Um, I, I think I was kind of trying to think like who might live and who die. Is Jay Kristoff going soft? First of all, at least one horse has survived. At least one horse has survived this book. Argent, the real MVP, praying for your survival in book three. I was kind of trying to work out, like, you know that Gabe can't die, and you know that Celine can't die. Well, like, they're in it. They're, they're in it in the present day. So, like, unless they got killed in present day on, like, the last page, I know they're not dying in that battle. I know in his stories Gabe had mentioned that Phoebe was gone, but I, I just didn't feel like she was really in danger at any point. And, like, so Phoebe lives... Like, even, like, Lackey lives, Aaron and Baptiste live. Everyone who dies is kind of, like, a, essentially, like, a nameless Silver Saint. So, like, a lot of the, a lot of the background, like, not even, like, B-side characters. Like, like, there was Robin the Silver Saint who was introduced in this book, had about four lines, and then, like, you see him die in, like, the big final battle, and it's like, okay, but I didn't care. Same for some of the Dusk Dancers who were named, got a description, and I think they were just there to sort of, like, pad out the deaths at the end, because... Really, who died? I don't know, because here's the thing again. <laughs> Prince, who, Connor, Phoebe's husband? Look, that could have been so interesting. Having Gabe and Phoebe basically kind of get together, and then to have Connor, Phoebe's husband, who she thought was dead the whole time, come back into the picture for her to have to make that decision about, like, like, which one of those men do you stay loyal to? That could have made for some, like, interesting, like, interpersonal character stuff. But he dies immediately. He came back just to die. R.I.P. my dude. Um, and I know it's meant to be sad and that that's probably why Phoebe is gone, that she's gonna blame Gabe because he was arguing with his sister and wasn't attentive enough to realise that they were still being attacked, essentially. Which I think is a dumb thing, like, you know, what if he'd just been at the other side of the room reading, like, one of the inscriptions or like looking at the statues or something like there were so many reasons why he might have not been able to like save Dior at that moment in time and also Connor and like okay fine um they did just kind of stand around and watch sure but like that's the, that's the ending right is that is that the person who dies is Dior um which spoilers she she doesn't she's well it says that she's opened her eyes so she's been um resurrected. So like Dura is still gonna be around in book three. I kind of feel like it would have been like it would have been a ballsy move to actually kill her. But then I don't know what the plot of book three would be. So I again that's the thing is like I, I suppose it was meant to be shocking but I think you just know that she's not gonna die because Dior was first of all Dior was never going to die like that and also if she did die then there just wouldn't be a book three. I'm sorry I'm like I'm aware <laughs> I'm like metatextually aware of how like this is gonna work. So, yeah, so like nobody died. Everybody lived. The only people that died were just like side characters, like padding characters, and I'm like, that's so weird. And to be fair, that is kind of how I felt about like the little band of adventurers from the first book. I did think that they were all like, like, was Bellamy anything other than just padding? No. Um, I don't know how to feel. I think a lot like book one is that I'm just sufficiently underwhelmed. I was kind of expecting it going in because obviously with book one I didn't know what to expect and so I got I, I got way too hype and with this one my expectations were very tempered and I just 
feel like we kind of drifted along in like lukewarm waters up until like right at the end where I was entertained but like I still don't think I'm really any more invested in the story um at this point like I probably will read book three because I, I, that's the finale isn't it and it's like well I might as well just see how it ends but I really think this series is always going to dance between a three and a four stars for me I got a feeling the other day of, I, I don't know if it's like synesthesia, but I thought back to like the, before the first book came out, like the marketing material and like some of like the little teasers, and back before I knew anything about like what the world or the characters or the writing or anything would be like, and the feeling I had of like what I expected, like the vibe and like the, just the sensation of like looking at that, how I imagined the book would feel to read, like, that impression kind of came back to me, and I was like, do you know, I would love a book that feels how I thought that that would feel, like how I felt looking at those things, and I still don't have it. I'm not sure if it's just because every single character in this is just so sarcastic and wisecracking and, like, even the characters that are meant to be serious, like, every single character is just sassy. Like, the vampires are all sassy. All the humans, like, if you just meet, like, a random barkeep, uh, any, any one of the Silver Saints, or, like, they're all they all have comebacks. If you say one thing to them, they're gonna say something snarky and rich. Oh my god, it's like, is this, is this, am I leveling such an insult at this, this series? It's like late stage Marvel humour in that, it's, it's one of those things where I, I think with, so sorry to bring Marvel into this, but like with some of like the early stuff, you know, they had like that kind of like sassy, quippy, like Marvel humour for a couple of characters. It kind of works because like obviously some of like the, you, you're going to get similarities between like some of the front men of like various franchises, whatever. Um, but then by like the end of Marvel, every single character is kind of like that and they're all doing comedic relief, which is weird because it's like at, at some point the comedy does not need relieving. Like there are no characters in this that are wholly serious. I, I think the only characters that don't really get to like quip and jape and sass are maybe the characters that just don't really have much speech and I'm thinking even some of the Silver Saints that have like a couple lines will say something kind of like sassy and bitchy and and I wonder if that's maybe why I have such a disconnect with this because like I don't know sometimes when I'm expecting like I mean if you're calling this gothic literature I know that so many of the characters are like oh woe is me but like they're so sassy. They're so jocular. And I did say the one thing that I did not want was Jay Kristoff's sassy band of talking misfits, and I feel like that's why I'm giving this book so much lenience, because while we did have, while every character in this is, you know, sassy and quippy and what have you, um, they didn't all come together in one big band of pointlessness <laughs> to just journey and snark. Um, so I at least appreciated that we didn't have like eight of them all going round at once like some sort of like hideous amalgamation of vitriolic remarks and humor like some sort of like rat king of quippy comebacks like i'm so like that is so much what i expected from this book is just the, the fact that we didn't have that i i think i just it's like a sword blow that never comes and like i'm thankful for it but at, at the end of the day did I enjoy this more than book one? I don't think I did. I think I'm less disappointed than book one because I knew what to expect, but also I don't think any part of this book hit the highs for me that like my first like day or two reading book one actually managed to reach. So I'm, I'm not really sure what to make of this at this point. I, I feel like I just had so much to say about book one and with this I'm like, well, book one did so much setup and this what did they achieve in this book? What did they do? The circuitous route we took to get there, I just feel like everything <laughs> between like the first couple chapters and last couple chapters was just pointless padding. It was just kind of like, oh, we're going here, we're going there, we're going here, we're going there, and it was like a lot of back and forth. There is even a map like right at the end. Where is it? The map at the end supposedly shows like, it's so hard to see, um, but it supposedly shows like Dior's path in squares and Gabe's path is like the the little dots but the thing is I don't think it does because in book one they were at Red Watch and in this book Gabriel doubles back and goes back to Red Watch for a bit and like that's not really reflected on the map like you'd think it would crisscross back over itself but it doesn't so I, I think this is their journey of book one and then not counting any time they backtrack the rest of the journey into book two so I don't know what the point of that was um did we have to have 600 pages of 
preamble just to get the answer to the questions we had right on the start of page one. I feel like we should have had those answered some point towards like the midsection and then get something else to hook me going in. We ended book one with those questions and I know it was only at the start of this book that Celine explained the existence of like these elder Asana vampires who were gonna teach her or like tell Dior this stuff and like teach Gabriel about the sanguimancy so he could get answers and something about like it's I don't know I don't, the bloodline I don't care Oh, although speaking of, we did find out who Gabe's dad was. She ate his dad. <laughs> she just, she ate his fucking father. She treated him like a cold, crisp Capra son. I gotta respect her for it. Like, honestly, do you know what? Maybe sometimes if a man withholds information, you should eat him. If you're going to take that long to get to the point of the book, because like so much of this setup is immediately following on from the way book one ended, and the thing is, like, the stuff with the prophecy and the stuff with the sangromancy, like, these are questions that were raised towards the end of book one, and we sort of re-established them going into book two. But I wouldn't expect it to take the entirety of book two to get those answers, or, or like, even some of them, which we should have had, like, some revelation, some satisfaction, like, close off some of those, like, plot threads, and throughout the course of the book we should have opened new ones, and then by the end of this book, anything like left unsolved brings me into book three. But it was just, hey, we're going to raise a question at the start, do nothing in the middle, answer the question at the end, and then like you're left with, I don't know, the, the finale that will be book three. And I'm like, I just, uh, I feel, I just feel like it should have been different. <laughs> Because book one set up a lot of stakes and raised a lot of questions, but book two did none of that. Book two was just all padding. It's so middle book. I'm realising right now that it is the middle book. It's middle book syndrome. Granted, maybe all of this stuff did need to happen, or... I, I honestly feel like you could have shaved it down, though. You could have just not done any of this, in fact. Like, it, it is fiction at the end of the day, and... I reckon I could cut this down into a 100 page story if I really tried. I just feel like the story hasn't really progressed. Characters have been busy doing other things, but it's like it's like me and my ADHD brain where I have one task to complete and I will do so many other things in between before I actually get to that task. Because that's what my brain's like. And honestly, reading this book is a bit like that. I'm like, can, can we just get on with it? Can we move on with it? I'm just going to really quickly like check my notes. Did I write down anything? Did I have any other thoughts while reading this? No. I had no further thoughts while reading this. My, my head was apparently empty. The only note I do have is I do have a drawing of like the cool S. <laughs> That's my most recent note. So I, I guess I didn't think anything else while finishing this that I thought it worth mentioning. I, at this point I feel like I'm not going to have any further thoughts. It reaches neither the highs nor the lows of book one. What else is there to say? I mean like I, I'm glad that I've read it um, and I hope it doesn't take too long for the third book to come out so that I can, like, put this series to bed. I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it for my vlog. I feel like I've really been through it in this one. Like, <laughs> I mean, the start of this vlog was just chaos, so it, it probably makes sense that the rest of this is, I don't know, disjointed as it is. Um, hopefully it's not been too hard to watch. Thank you so much for watching. Um, if you did make it this far through all my rambling revelations or whatever you want to call them, um, leave me a little skull emoji um because i see some skulls here and i mean i'm assuming if you are watching this because this is heavy spoilers for the second book in a chunky ass series either you are never going to read this and like you just don't care about spoilers or you have read this book in which case um if you have read this i would love to hear your thoughts on it and like did you agree or disagree with anything i've said so far but also like how are you feeling about this series like how are you rating it <laughs> i think i am in the minority i, I think most people really really love this and like I, I want to be one of you so bad my standards are too high i'm like that i'm like that tiktok that plant i'm like the ph of this soil is too high i fear i may die um yeah if you made it this far let me know how you're feeling about this book and like are you in agreement with me how did you have any strong emotional reactions to like any part of this maybe even tell me like your favorite or least favorite thing about it because if you like something about it, I can probably at least agree with it. Like, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> Remind me why I should be invested again. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, hopefully you've, I don't know, enjoyed this, been entertained, something. Hopefully I haven't just, like, wasted all of your time. <laughs> so I'm going to end this here, and hopefully I'll maybe see you guys in the next video. Bye.